I'm mad at George Lucas. I'm mad at George Lucas because he begins each of his Star Wars films with these ten words. You all know them. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. The world first saw those words, taken, of course, from the traditional opening used in fairy tales in 1977, and they changed everything. Up until that point, science fiction had been making slow but steady progress toward respectability in the public consciousness. It's hard to imagine in today's era in which most of the box office sensations are science fiction or fantasy, and there's a dedicated science fiction channel on TV that we used to go for years between major SF films. But that's the way it used to be. Prior to Star Wars, the original film, you had to go back nine years to 1968 to find a year with a truly major science fiction movie. That year was remarkable, in fact, because it had two science fiction blockbusters, 2001, A Space Odyssey. To this day, Arthur C. Clarke is still the only science fiction novelist ever to have been nominated for an Academy Award. He shared an Oscar Best Screenplay nomination for that film, and the original Planet of the Apes. Now, if you haven't watched the 1968 Planet of the Apes recently, or if your only knowledge of it is from that dreadful 2001 remake, you may not realize just how trenchant a commentary it was on its times. In 1968, America was struggling with race relations and with the fear of nuclear war. And those two things are what Planet of the Apes is about. The ending, perhaps the best known ending sequence in the history of cinema since Casablanca, with Charlton Heston pounding the sands in front of the ruins of the Statue of Liberty and shouting, you maniacs, you blew it up. God damn you all to hell, is a clear anti-nuclear war message. And the very first ape who speaks in the, at length in that film is a chimpanzee, a member of one of the three ape species that coexist uneasily in his world. And he's complaining about the racial quota system that's been keeping him down, even though it's been officially abolished. And what was on TV in the 1960s? Well, the evening news was preoccupied with the struggle to desegregate the South, with the war in Vietnam, and with unrest on university campuses. But once the news was over, what did we find for the rest of the evening? TV shows like Green Acres, Get Smart, Gilligan's Island, programs with nothing at all to say about real life. I mean, for Pete's sakes, Get Smart was set in Washington, D.C., where all the protests about Vietnam were directed, and yet it never once mentioned them. In fact, the only social comment in any of those shows was a throwaway bit on Gilligan's Island. The stranded boat was the SS Minnow, the SS Minnow, and it was named for Newton Minnow, who on May 9, 1961, had famously raked the National Association of Broadcasters over the coals for having turned television into a vast wasteland. Gilligan's Island creator Sherwood Schwartz felt that Minnow's highbrow approach would ruin television, and he said basically, I'll show you vast wasteland, and named the boat in his honor. But there was one primetime show that dealt with the issues of the day, albeit with disguises, with metaphor, at a distance, by parable. The original Star Trek was clearly talking about Vietnam, about race relations, about prejudice, about overpopulation. I'll never forget the first time I saw Batman's Riddler, Frank Gorshin himself, made up as a half-black, half-white character, locked in a war of hate with another man whose color scheme was reversed. And the episode, A Private Little War, was a direct mirroring of the Vietnam War, with Captain Kirk's Federation standing in for the Americans and the Klingons playing the role of the Russians. I was a kid when Star Trek debuted in 1966, but even then, I could see that it was tackling the same issues being talked about on the evening news. And as I started reading SF books in the 1970s, I discovered that the literature had always been that way, right back to its roots. There used to be a lot of debate about what the first science fiction book was. The term was coined in 1926, but SF stories clearly predate that moniker. 
Now, though most people within the field have come around to agreeing with British author and critic Brian Aldous, who argues that the first work of SF, as opposed to fantasy or any other genre, was Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, first published in 1818. It was the first novel in which the plot hinged on a scientific notion. Dr. Frankenstein observes the decay and corruption that occurs after death and recognizes that these are clearly chemical processes that, if he studied them minutely, he might be able to reverse, creating life from dead matter, thereby doing what previously only nature or God had done. Frankenstein is widely taught at universities to this day and in two types of courses. Naturally, it's often the first book in a science fiction course, but it's also widely taught in women's studies or feminist studies because it's a direct social comment on new reproductive technologies and the role of women. In Mary Shelley's day, members of her sex were disenfranchised and marginalized. They had no power except the power of the creation of life. And if you take that from women and give it to men, said Shelley, it will be a disaster because men lack the empathy and compassion required to properly nurture life. In the novel, everything goes wrong when Victor, very deliberately, not Victoria Frankenstein, rejects his creation, having been interested only in the scientific puzzle he was trying to solve. 